You ready? Yeah. You never know. The absurdity of fandom and sports and how fans feel like they can talk shit about athletes and how athletes aren't allowed to be human beings yeah i mean look i didn't get to the i lived my whole life in that sphere but then right before it became a business to me i got cut short so i didn't have that experience i just have a bunch of buddies and then i'll be there like looking at people like talking to my buddies in the most wild manner because they feel like they indebted to them because their local team pays them a bunch of money yeah to perform at their the level expected yeah and if you don't fuck you yeah you're not worth it yeah you know like yeah. there's like no there's a whole human element that gets buried in the whole crazy dichot or dynamics of sports and yeah. fandom and yeah well i think it starts with why the fuck do we find out what guys are being paid like right off the bat it's the number one headline you know yeah, everybody on the planet knows what pat patrick mahomes record breaking deal was better live up to it man yeah i mean just now we we're down there eating lunch and on the bot they're talking about carson wentz and saying this is the first year of his four-year 128 million dollar deal better show up bro yeah better do something you and know if, and if you don't you're trash yeah and it goes to you know talking about johnny manzel or mike tyson i mean you know that thing happened with johnny where he didn't show up for that camp. He didn't show up for us here either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, did I say that bitch. on the podcast last night? <laughs> he's literally the Phantom of the Opera. Like, That's hilarious. He's just, uh, he can appear yeah. and reappear and disappear or whatever. Yeah. He's just, until he's right in front of you, he's not there. Or for me, when I was a kid growing up, watching on 60 Minutes the story of Ricky Williams. Yeah. When he went AWOL. Yeah. And was just like, I'm going to Australia. I'm going to live in a tent. I'm going to this fucking ashram in Northern California and going to learn yoga and meditation. You know? He was one of the, he was one, I kind of forgot about that him. That was super inspiring to me, though, you know, because for the first time in my life, I was, I was young when I saw that. But I was in the football groove of maybe freshman, sophomore year of high school. God, I don't know if he's that much older than me. Something like that, though. Yeah. But I remember seeing that and going, oh, you can be an athlete and a human being at the same time. That's interesting. You know? Yeah. Because everybody, they really wanted to paint him in that story oh, as yeah. this degenerate. A burnout. Like, right? Yeah, burnout. Yeah. You know, deadbeat father. Like, they really wanted to get Stoner. that. Stoner. Yeah, but it just didn't come off like that. Yeah. You know, because he's too, he was like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to play football until I can't walk, you know? Is that the goal? Yeah. Is that what we're That's here the glory. to do? Yeah. Then everybody will be happy. Yeah, I mean, media has really turned pro athletes into something other than human. Yeah. Uh, you know mean, an interesting one right now is Kyrie. Are you Are you a privy Kyrie to that Irving. at all so he's openly like going down a spiritual path he's open about you know um just the powers that be and like being told how to be and how to act and just this how whole thing this this whole world that he's lived you know kind of become a man in where he's not really <clears throat> like living or thinking for himself it kind of feels like in that world and he's talked about it a bunch but he also is open about like mental health issues uh -huh. and family issues <laughs> that, you know, like he's just in this season, he's just like ducking out. Interesting. He's ducked out like multiple times. He's came and left like three, four times. Mm. And he's just like, yo, like I have shit in my life that I have to attend to that's yeah. more important. Yeah. There's nothing more important than having my life in order, like yeah. so that I can perform and be a good teammate. And yeah. It's crazy. What's See, wrong with that? It's crazy seeing the reaction. People, fuck you, selfish, yeah. entitled. Yeah. Like, it's his life, man. I know. Like, I know. You know, and he takes fines for the, like, you know. Yeah. I think there's something interesting to be said, maybe going forward, uh, an innovation of this space in an ideal way. It's just like, hey, pro, like, if, if in fact something comes up in your life, like, that's one acceptable two like your pay will be deducted for the like the value of the games like kind of a prorated type thing sure. in a sense of at least normalizing it to a certain extent because now it's, i mean Kyrie's kind of a beacon for it a little bit he's mm. just like look this is 
Yeah. This is what it is, you know? But it's, it's yeah. I think it's something with spirituality, with social media and connections to people as human beings versus just going and watching them play in New Jersey. Yeah. You, you can identify with them as humans more so today yeah. versus like, yo, go to the Cowboys game. They're down there on the field. That's all I know of Michael yeah. Irving as, you yeah. know? But yeah. now, it, in this day and age, as a new athlete, like, there's this whole other veil that's been lifted to, like, their human side. Yeah. I've, I wrote an article about this maybe last season, last NFL season, because I was blown away by the amount of guys who were requesting trades, who were being vocal about being unhappy with their coaches, mm -hmm. being unhappy with their situation, especially in the NFL. That wasn't happening even when I was in there. You know, I was there 2009 to 2014, and it was like unhurt. Maybe the superstar of the team might say something. Right. But these were, it was just like popping up all over the place. And I think it has a lot to do with, like you said, social media has a lot to do with it. Players feel empowered. You got a direct voice. You know, you can control the narrative. Yeah. Um, and that's really powerful. I think that's a big, and like you're saying, you know, Kyrie, and this is kind of a new, it's all new, you know, because yeah. we've never been in this territory before right. of, of athletes. This dude, I mean, I've said this before, and I don't know if people get pissed off about this or not, but it's pretty much true. It's, you know, pro athletes, it's, it's like a slave model. Yeah. You know, you're enslaved, you're getting paid millions of dollars, but you're enslaved by the, by that world, by that environment, mm -hmm. you know? Because it's like, you can't fuck up, you can't be a human being, you can't take days off, mm -hmm. you better perform, mm -hmm. if you don't, we're gonna get you cut, or whatever, you know? Imagine if you were at your fucking desk job or whatever, your corporate job. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a live stream of fucking 60,000 people yeah, watching you. watching you. And then as soon as you botch that one email or that call, they're like, boo, <laughs> you fucking suck. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, every single yeah. mistake and then the wins aren't celebrated as much, but the amount of pressure that human beings, I mean, we talk about chaos and peace and, you know, the getting to Zen and getting to these meditative places where you can really enjoy life at its like basic form. And then you, you throw in absurd amount of pressure oh. um, and absurd amount of attention. That's not normal for other human beings. For human beings to get so much attention from other human beings all at once, I mean, we're talking about energy and uh -huh. th what that does to your energy and what it does. I mean, it could do great things in the sense of rising to the occasion and sports is a beautiful thing for so many reasons. Yeah. But these elements that take a real taxing, it's a very taxing thing on your, your mind, body, and soul to have, feel like you have no freedom to like explore yourself as a human being, oh, you know, yeah. and, and like really try to, Get your feet like I have times where we all do. We, where we're off. I'm not an athlete in public and shit, but like you have to. Sometimes you gotta go out to the woods and like gather yourself and like totally, dude. fucking. Whether it's not going out to the woods, just going somewhere by yourself and like getting your feet back under you. Where these guys, you know, it's it's hard. It's really hard. It's super hard, man. That's you know one of the things I really, I somehow always end up talking about is that life after sports transition mm -hmm. you know and for me like i said i came out of my nfl career i was like who the fuck am i you know and i was kind of having like we talked about like having the blueprint of who i was kind of in my mind's eye to some extent you mm -hmm. know even having that and having this this connection with a higher power connection with myself i even came out of that mm -hmm. career and i was like who the fuck am I? Because, yeah. like, every relationship you have is built around this yeah. thing that you are. Right. You know? Like, during my NFL career, even my college football career, I mean, family would come, friends would come. It was always like, give Eb his space. Mm -hmm. Let Eb do his thing. Eb, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Let Eb do that. You know, it was like constant. My whole life was like that. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you're taken out of that. Yep. And you're Fish not water, there. Man. You're just like, how, where do I go? You know? And it takes it takes time, and it's a process. And I don't, you know, when I talk to young guys or I, I give talks about anything like that, I'm like, take the time, take as much time during your career as you possibly can 
to do things to figure out what the fuck you're into. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy doing? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Because right It makes then, you feel good when you do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, what are you really into? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Music, entertainment. You know, for me, it was, I kind of, the universe is just, I'm so blessed, man, because the universe has taken me to every place in my whole life, you know? Yeah. Like, I was, I had dislocated my shoulder, had shoulder surgery, so I was done for the season, my second year. I'm at this charity event that I'm putting on, and in walks the music director of the local NPR station. And he's just start talking to him. He's like, hey, man, why don't you come in? You could talk about your charity event, bring a playlist of music. We'll jam. I'll show you the studio. I go in there. I'm like, I'm in love with it because I just love that. Yeah. You know? I love, I love storytelling. I love curating a vibe, yeah. you know? Yeah. We start talking, do a show. He says, hey, man, I have some open slots I need to fill. Would you like your own show? I was like, fuck yeah. So this dude. is year two in the NFL? Yeah. So for my last three years in, in Jacksonville, I had this radio show on NPR in Jacksonville. And um, it just inspired me. And even like sitting in the locker room, throw a dip in on Adderall, mm -hmm. you know, just talking to the dudes in the locker room. I thought to myself, I was like, I want a job where I talk to people. This is the vibe, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I just love talking to people. Yeah. And here we are. We're doing podcasts. We're out in the fucking woods. Yeah, Chopping man. it I up. I mean, now this is something else, dude. I mean, this <laughs> is fucking crazy. Like, the mountains. It's nuts, dude. But, I mean, for you, man, I'm really interested in you and your story because you were a D1 baseball player. Yeah. Yeah. I, um... Like, where did the music come in? Yeah, I have a really weird story. It's, I it's, love uh, that. <laughs> it's about as strange as it gets, really. Um, what's interesting, and I'll highlight, and I've talked about it, I haven't talked about it much, is I, I had to really rack my brain once this whole thing happened. I had to rack my brain back to when I was a kid. And I was, I wrote some like raps and like uh. some shit when I was like 10. Uh huh. And it just went by the wayside. Like, uh -huh. I don't, I didn't retain that much as, like, who, my identity or anything. Yeah. But my most, when you're a kid, that's, like, there's yeah. no outside, ooh, how, how am I going to make this cool? Like, do people think I'm cool? I was just doing it because I was drawn to do it. Yeah. And I was, and I never even, you know, but I would, I did that. And then I rapped in a talent show and I was, like, 11. Wow. And the only time I ever did anything musically ever. I was just so an funny. athlete. But for whatever reason, like, I felt so clean and cool to do that at uh -huh. that time being yeah. an 11 year old kid yeah um but yeah man like when i so i, I was your 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 typical student athlete jock i you know i i i was always kind of um come from a super blue collar family blue collar area but had everything i ever needed for my family they, uh -huh. they catered to me yeah and my sister and just took care of us it was just you two guys yep and uh, from Cranston, Rhode Island. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. you can drive through Rhode Island in an hour. Um, and, you know, had a really tough guy edge to me. Like, we had a, it was a tough neighborhood. Like, we were getting a bunch of, I got kicked out of middle school for fighting. I was, you know, like, and now I look back, I'm like, I mean, even up, <laughs> even up, so I, so I, long story short, right, I'm, I'm always the best athlete. Yeah. Always, you know, baseball and basketball, I was really good. And, but there was always this undertone of like, uh, it's Rhode Island, man. Like, mm. this isn't a powerhouse. Like, <laughs> even the local, like, you know, like, the local parents or, like, kid, like, there was the doubt that I felt from them that I could do it at the next level and the next level uh -huh. was actually a huge fuel for me. Uh -huh. Like, being a kid from Rhode Island, like, I had this absurd ERA. Like, I was a Gatorade Player of the Year. Oh, I had, like, an ERA, like, under one, like a .7 ERA, which are absurd numbers. Yeah, yeah. The amount totally. of innings I threw. And, like, yeah, but you're in Rhode Island, man. You know, like, there's probably seven guys in Texas that are better. They're just playing a bunch of better kids. Uh-huh. Because Texas, you're playing year-round. Yeah. You know, in yeah. Rhode Island, you're not. Uh-huh. So I'm, like, you know, deep down, I kind of always knew I, I, I had it, though, you know? So I end up start throw harder later in my career at junior senior i get recruited by duke a bunch of high level schools i choose duke um because i value it's interesting because right now i have a much higher passion for learning than i did then uh -huh. but i did well in school and i almost lumped it in with like oh i'm gonna be a great baseball player i, I need to be a great athlete i need to be a great in academics as well because this mm. will this will help me mm. you know i understood that and 
I kind of looked at it as competition in its own right, kind of supporting itself. Like, uh -huh. I could get these A's. You yeah. Know? And what did I, you major in? At Duke, uh -huh. sociology. Oh, really? Yep. And uh, a minor in like business economics. Okay. So it's kind of that makes sense. Yeah, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I get to Duke, which was crazy. You know, being from Rhode Island, like very rarely that was happening. And I go, and I just, I had a fucking miraculous year. Mm. Like every single thing, I've talked about this before, but every single thing I did on the mound that year. There was times where I, I was like, why didn't that get hit over the fence? Mm. Like, I was in the best league, ACC, and, like, yeah. every single thing that entire year went my way. Ugh. I go on, I have the lowest, I still to this day have the lowest ERA there. Just had a miraculous year. Uh huh. And I'm, like, riding high. I get all, I'm all American. All right, cool, I'm ready. Now, in baseball, you can't get drafted till after junior year. Oh, interesting. So if I was available, I would have left. Interesting. But I wasn't even I wasn't even available to uh -huh. be drafted. Yeah. Go to the Cape Cod Baseball Summer League. That's a huge, yeah. infamous huge. league. I'll yeah. go out there, elbow, uh. pops. So, you know, I'll I'll have, I'll shorten the story, but like I really had a tough journey with my arm coming back. Uh -huh. The whole time, very positive minded. Yeah. I'm gonna come back better, throwing harder. Yeah. You know, because there is an upside to having Tommy John oh, surgery yeah, where sure. like some guys come back. Yeah. I mean Tommy John himself. Right. Played for fucking 30 years. Exactly. My point to that is, so there's a lot of people like, yo, like, every, there's a pretty common thing like, oh, you, you come back from Tommy John, you could be even better. You know, I'll make a side note that I played with about nine or ten guys throughout my time in college and no one came back. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I mean, my totally. point is, like, you hear about the guys that come back because they're on TV. They right. made it. That's why you know about them. <laughs> yeah. But you don't hear about the guys that fucking all fade the, off. All the dudes that Yeah. Did, yeah. So I had a really... That was my first hardship in life. Yeah. I, I went that. from being like the big man and I was really like, this yeah. was, I was really revved up. Like my whole life was yeah. arcing to this. Uh -huh. And right before I came to fruition, it got taken away from pretty much like a rug out from under my feet, you yeah. know? Yeah. As you know, in play know sports, like this happens, you know? So yeah. I, um, dude, I thank the fucking Lord. I literally thank whoever, you know, I thank, I'm so thankful that it happened, but I, I would have never, ever thought I would say that then. So you finished at Duke? Yeah, I graduated from Duke. Uh, I went on to Georgetown grad. Really? And I had, I went on to Georgetown grad and had, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I had two years of eligibility. So I'm like, yo, I'm going to get a graduate degree. I'm going to come back. My arm's going to get better. I had this whole mindset. Like, I'm still, I'm going to get more degree and I'm going to go, you know, and that's how Love I was. That. And, and um, dude, right at, towards the end of Duke, I started dabbling with GarageBand. Which is a which is a program that literally comes on your MacBook. Yeah, so I didn't yeah. I didn't even sort it out. Like it wasn't like I'm gonna get this program. Uh -huh. Like it just like I got hurt and I couldn't travel with the team and I was just bored. Yeah. And I just got drawn to it again, almost like when I was a kid. It's amazing. And um, dude, one of the, the first thing I ever put out, a song called College Humor, it just kind of went viral. Amazing. And, and you know, viral in a scheme of like, you know, this was kind of before the term viral was really a thing. Uh huh. Like. Twitter was just kind of brand new. This is, you know, this is nine years ago. Yeah. So Instagram wasn't really a thing, like TikTok, all this shit. YouTubers, like I was, I kind of became a YouTuber before YouTubers were a huge thing. And I basically just started, my my teammates fucked with it. And then we put it online and like people started fucking with it. So I'm putting, I started, I probably put two or three songs out over the span of time, but I'm still completely rehabbing. I'm in school. Uh -huh. I'm like, this isn't my career. Yeah, you're just, I'm just doing, doing it for this fun. thing, and it's cool, right? Yeah. So I go to Georgetown, and I've done it. I probably put about three or four songs out, and we start traveling with the team, and we're going to other schools, and I'd go out on the field for a game Friday night, and there's fans from the school that are fans of my music. So they're like Mike Stein. What? You know what I mean? And then that was one of the first things I was like, oh shit. You know what I mean? I kind of that actualized it for me, where like there was actually, and then. The second, the next weekend, we go to Louisville, University of Louisville, and there's like fucking 30, there's more kids. And then the next weekend, there was, you know, like it started to be a thing. Wild. And um, then I'm, I'm, I'm pitching, and I fucking suck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm a, I'm a shit bum version of myself. You know, like, you know that feeling oh, where you're like, totally, dude. you can't enjoy there, baseball bro. as much when you know you're a watered down version of yourself. It totally did. And I any was sport, I mean. Any sport. Yeah. Yeah. Really anything. And yeah, anything. I, anything. Yeah. 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 And I, that, 
I was like learning this all in real time. Like I was just like, oh, this oh, this isn't fun to me I'm not anymore. Who I am anymore? Yeah, it's not but, who like, I was. Think of, dude. I I can't express to you how fast it happened to where uh-huh. I left. I left in the mid season. Uh-huh. I was middle. Like I from still Georgetown. Had, yeah, uh-huh. I had to go on tour. I started getting hit up by agents. So like, yo, people are asking about uh-huh. you. Like, let's start. If you want to do this, like you have a little flame right here. So I was like, fuck it. So like, imagine that call to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> my Georgetown grad. Hey, how are you? <laughs> how you doing out there? I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go on tour as a rapper, Mike Stud. <laughs> and like, yeah, hats off to my parents, what? man. Like, they're so fucking cool. They they went through the pain with me. Like, they saw my fault, my slow decline of like, yeah. I got hurt and like we really scratched and clawed to get back, and I just wasn't the same. Yeah. And like, I was a really like confident pitcher and a very just I, I didn't think about what I was doing. I was just good at it, yeah. and all that went. Yeah. And um, so my parents were like, I'm sure they were very skeptical to themselves behind closed doors, but they like they got behind it. They're just like, if this is what you want to do, you know, you kind of always seem to figure it out. So just do it and go for it, you know. So Amazing. we literally started going out in a fucking minivan, me and these guys. How long have you known these guys? Um, Blue, childhood, been next door neighbors since we were five. Literally, Amazing. like. Out of a movie, like if you walk out my front door, his house is like eight feet that way. Amazing. Um, Kilmer, as soon as I started as Mike Stud, right as I'm this journey I'm talking about, right when we started going on the road, I probably had about four or five songs out. He reached out and was like, Yo, I like your stuff. Now, you know how I mentioned the Mastermind Alliance, like the Think uh-huh. and Grow Rich, where you, I think that's probably one of my better traits. It's yeah. just like, All right, I'm not good at this. What do I need? Yeah. Let's fill this void. Uh huh. Kilmer came in and was like a task man. Like yeah. he he had a studio I could record at. Amazing. Um, he could record me. So like it's called an engineer. Um, he made beats. He made videos. Uh-huh. So a guy with no money. Yeah. You know, I'm fresh out of college, yeah. no money. Yeah. Um, I needed a guy like that to actualize. Like I could st- start making songs, videos, content for no budget. You know, and like he he was able to just be like, yo, I'm gonna go on this ride with you. He saw the whole thing. So I just like wired him we just became family i mean that yeah. was eight years ago yeah um versace uh the legend um <laughs> man we were torn in 2015 or 16 in omaha and we pull up to a venue and there's a guy out on in front of the venue about five hours before the show started <laughs> in a full versace jumpsuit and <laughs> on a moped amazing. on a moped like it's i was just like old. i have to go talk to this guy what is he doing <laughs> And he slowly yeah. became, he slowly became, like, worked really cool with our fans and shit. And that's uh-huh. how we built this. Like, yeah. So, like, he was a fan, but, yeah. like, right away he came to some more shows and he was, like, helping out. Like, unloading the, the bus, like, loading shit back in. Like, we were doing shit so grassroots, like, we would break down the, our own stage. Yeah. Like, we'd have to, like, we'd come in, take all the shit out, and, like, we were really, we didn't have, like, a big team. Uh-huh. So then I noticed him right away being, like, so valuable and such a hard worker. Yeah. I hire him to come on the bus. Yeah. Um, yeah, And then now he lives in my house and (laughs) big part of our family, you know, so. um, You got a great crew, man. Great crew of people. Yeah. Yeah, give him the, give him the, come on, dude, do a cameo, bro. We got a backwood delivery. (laughs) Look at this thing, it's a fucking cannon. (laughs) cannon. (laughs) This thing will blast you off over these mountains. It's a fucking (laughs) cigar, dude. Um, No, it's amazing, man. Yeah. It's amazing, dude. We have a crazy. But you're like, you know. Like this, this is a testament to it, you know, to everything you've done and how you go about things. Yeah, honestly, man, it was a fucking. It's been a. It's been a build to here. Like we, uh-huh. we, me and these same guys, like we just we roughed it for a long time. Yeah. So it's really like this has been the most rewarding phase of my life ever. Uh huh. Because it came to fruition. It's amazing. And it's like we didn't. I didn't have to be mainstream or be famous really because yeah. I didn't really. It's not what it's about yeah, for me. Fuck me. Fuck Actually, all that too, man. You know, I, I've you can relate. Like you're, I've, I'm very close to people who have that, and it's scary and it's not something. Yeah. If I really take inventory of how I feel, it's not what I want. For anybody who thinks they want to be famous, imagine you can't go anywhere because people just come up to you like, all the, the time. The day you feel like shit and like you're a little tired and like yeah. you're at the grocery store and you're just like, I wish this was going faster, and then like seven people come up to you and want to take pictures. And yeah. Like, Oh. Maybe even say some out of pocket shit to you because people yeah. do. Or have you signed something or fucking. Yeah, dude. All the time. All the time. 
Yeah. All the it's, time. It's really tough. Like, I, back to the human thing, like, uh, this is a man-made construct, fame. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's in our innate nature to be immortalized or, or you know, people admiring you and uh, putting so much attention on you at all times. It's really hard for your ego. Well, we used to do it with gods. Yeah. You know, in mythology. You know, in Greece, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they would they would create mythology around these characters that they idolize. Now we have celebrities, yep. you know, and that's our new mythology that we've created. Um, but these guys are su just such good guys, man. Like, you got such a good crew of people here. Like, that's... Everyone who comes around says the exact same thing. Yeah. It's Not just that like I need any validation. Because yeah. I just know how I feel. Yeah, of course. But, you know, you said it to me in there. Like, or I think someone said it to me. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without, I wouldn't, like, it sounds, that, I don't even mean that in the cliche way. Like, oh, wouldn't we all pulled the rope the same way? <laughs> I mean, like, I literally physically wouldn't be here. Like, I don't, uh -huh. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't be here with any other people. Yeah. I don't I don't know who I would be here with and I wouldn't be on this vibe and yeah. The shit we've done, none of it would have gone down the way it went down. Like none of this makes any sense without doing it this way. Yeah. And I think a lot of people So like, you know, there was parts of my journey where like I got I was like really hot in this college scene in like 2014, uh -huh. 2015. And I kind of forecasted. I saw this college scene ending. Like I uh -huh. That's why the mic, the Mike stud, the mic thing, like this has been in my head for a long time. Interesting. Because there's there's a an association that comes with Mike stud. There's a ceiling to Mike stud that I was aware of. I knew it. Interesting. It's just like, oh, isn't that like the college rapper dude? <laughs> yeah, like those guys are douchey. They're cool though. You know, like that shit. You know what I mean? Totally, bro. Where uh, I knew that was a thing. You know, and I, and I kind of I kind of saw the college thing being a phase and a fad, which it was. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it, thank God, you know, yeah. it blasted me off. There was a real thing there. But my point was, I was really hot in the scene and a bunch of labels were courting me heavily. Uh -huh. And I had people like really close close to me, not my core group, because they never really doubted it. Like we were always on the same page, but like, like, what are you doing, bro? Like, take the deal. Like, uh -huh. let's run this shit up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I never, I just followed, I never went with it. I never thought there was a good, I never had a good energy or synergy with any company. I was very aware of like the downfalls of the music industry and I had had some real conversation with people who had done life-changing record deals and I put those in air quotes because Pretty it was much. actually life-changing for the worst. Right, right. You know, so I was very, very aware um, that there's a facade uh -huh. here with this music industry and um, I also... What is it? Like, what is... Why is... Because everybody says that. Yeah, no, Music industry's crazy. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors, man, and it's a lot of... Ter we, we talk about the slave business of... Uh-huh. Oh, my God. Like, so you they, just get caught... You get hooked into a deal. They call them slave deals in music, too. Uh-huh, yeah. Like, like starving artists, like, that's a real... Like, starving artists is a term. Because uh -huh. yeah. the fucking, like, the people who actually create the art, they're just a commodity, uh -huh. and they get... They're usually not business savvy. They're uh -huh, usually not aligned yeah. with business savvy people, especially a lot of artists come from nothing, no money. So when you say, hey, here's 200K, right. you're like, fuck, I'm rich. Yeah. You know, my mom's never, my mom, could, I could take care of my mom and shit. Like, yeah. And then all of a sudden they catch some, they catch some heat and they're like, I, they start looking at their bank account like, why isn't it coming in? Uh -huh. Because, bro, like the, the, the run of the mill prototype of a deal is like you get like 13 to 15 percent of your music income revenue God. now now throw into a mix that's you know that's kind of the old school now throw into the mix how much the music industry has changed so you talk about streaming it didn't even right. exist right when i started yeah spot now it is the fucking world like right. the whole music world revolves around streaming yeah so it's this ever evolving no one's really knows how to under like no one we don't really have it under wraps like Everybody's... as far as like many multiple like most artists feel as though like look spotify apple like streaming's great but let's figure out how to compensate artists better uh -huh. because they're in these deals and you're getting you're getting a small amount of a small amount uh -huh. now what i mean by that is spotify they're paying 0. 0.00007 cents per stream or something like what is it kilmer like how does it break down stream wise for payment yeah less Jesus. Less than half a penny a stream. But then, 
that, that amount, then 13% of that is yours. <laughs> so that's what's happening, bro. So then the guy, then they're like, oh, I make a bunch of money. So the whole spiel is they sell you the, hey man, do you want, do you want your whole backyard or do you want, you want a quarter of that mountain? Uh, like we'll make it a mountain. Uh, now, granted, and, and, and uh, you know, shit like Post Malone where it fucking works and it goes to the moon, everyone's happy. Cool. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Great. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But the 95% of the artists who become very quickly, they're not prioritized. Right. Now, there's no label. There's no, there's no limit on the label how many artists they can acquire. Uh-huh. So they're just fucking acquiring the next guy, the next guy. Oh, didn't work. Yeah. We put 200K behind your shit. It didn't work. Sorry. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah. They don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So of course. It's like you're just you're taking a huge gamble, and a lot of it's out of your control when you do a record deal, uh, you know? And, like, yeah. it is what it is. No, I just never, I just never took the cash. Uh huh. And I was lucky to have a touring. I had a touring element, like I told you. Like yeah. I started touring before anything. Really. Uh huh. And I had, I knew I could build this fan base and monetize them. And to me, this whole thing has been about like, how can I do this in a, how can I do this in an innovative way? Yeah, it's a that. very innovative time. Yeah. If you're a creator, yeah. There's sh- every day you can wake up tomorrow. Clubhouse, brand new app. Yeah. It's like a interactive podcast. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. yeah. Didn't exist a month ago. Now, yeah. like, it's, it's going to be a huge thing. And do you do that? I just did our first one, like, yesterday. Oh, yeah? Two days ago. I just went on for a half hour. and I got turned on to it, and I turned it on one thing, and I was like, I'm fucking already overwhelmed. You'd be, this. you'd be great. You'd be yeah. great at it, though. We, we, we can help you. All right. It. It, it'd be super great. It's, it's actually one of the more easier things. Okay. Um, Cause you can someone just, get this lit? A, you just this, can someone light the bazooka <laughs> for us? Um, you just, like, start a conversation. Dude, I literally just chop it up with fans. Uh-huh. But we were already doing this thing called Steven Mingle, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> which is like I would go on Zoom calls with fans and like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. two, three hundred fans would be on there and I'm just Zooming them in and we'd video talk. Uh-huh. But that that's different because like it's video too. Yeah. But this element of just like, yo, I could be like walking around just having a talk with like to a thousand people uh-huh. on my, my fans. Uh-huh. And the way I run my business, like we've done it very, very... I, it's it's hard unless you're in the music game we've done it like extremely radical yeah left of like how, yeah, you, how you do business in this whole thing i love that though but it's paid off you right. know like it was a long haul yeah but it's paid off and it's exciting for me to be able to do the business side too yeah if i was just the artist i feel like i would get dried out like yeah, the man. artist side but now i'll be on conference calls and do shit and we're running these other things and doing other business all under the umbrella but then I go to make music and it's like a release. Like, yeah. it's not only thing I do, you know? Uh-huh. So, yeah, I mean, that was a long version of the story, but. <laughs> oh, it's awesome, dude. Yeah. It's so awesome, man. This beauty of a man is named Mike. Now, Mike's not only a man that likes to get down on the weekends, but he's also a man who drinks his whiskey straight and takes care of his mullet. They say you can judge a lot about a man by the look of his mullet. It shows fortitude and the ability to fucking rage. So when Mike fancies up his mullet, he uses products from Blue Man, like the Ascend Volume Cream and the Monarch Matte Paste. If you're a guy that has no idea what to do with his fucking hair, like myself and many others, and you want that really nice, nice sleek look, like Mike's mullet, the way it looks fantastic and slightly whimsical, It all starts with using the right products. Now for a while now, since Mike's had that mullet, he's been using products from Blue Man, that's B-L-U-M-A-A-N, and it's a two-part process, so I need you to listen up, write this down. The first step is about giving that hair some volume, and it's all about using Blue Man's Ascend Volume Cream. You apply this to your damp hair, and it's blow dry activated, so once you put it in, you you hit it with the blow dryer, and your hair will not only have volume, but it will speak volumes to everyone who sees it. The next step, once your hair is dry, you're gonna want that that nice finish. You need to tame that beast. So you're gonna use the Monarch Matte Paste. It's very lightweight. This is the whimsical factor I'm talking about, guys. It's lightweight, it's not like one of those heavy pastes. You put that Monarch right in your hair, you're gonna have a fantastic mullet, just like Mike's. If you choose to have a mullet, it's not mandatory. You can have whatever hairstyle you want. These products from Blue Man are fantastic for everyone. Speaking of fantastic, we get a great offer for you today. If you go to blueman.com, go to blueman.com, 
That's B-L-U-M-A-A-N.com. You're going to get 10% off your entire order using promo code YNK. So head on over to blueman.com. Get these fantastic products. I'm telling you, you need a regiment to get your hair looking fantastic and whimsical like Mike's. Use promo code YNK at checkout to get 10% off and tell them Steve sent you. John Kilmer here with a fantastic new product. Oh, I am recording. Good. Let's try that one more time. John Kilmer here with a fantastic new product. Today, we're talking about natural energy. None of that artificial bullshit. We're talking about natural energy and hydration. And the the people that are paving the way with energy and hydration are Liquid IV. You hear us talk about these guys all the time. We've been using their products for almost a year now. You may have heard about their hydration multiplier. You take one of like the, these little flavor packets, you put it in a bottle of water, and it's the equivalent hydration of two to three bottles of water. Magic. But they took it a step further with their energy multiplier. You're not only getting that hydration, but you're also getting that energy boost from natural energy. None of that artificial bullshit. I'm talking we, we, we replace our morning coffee with this stuff. We use it as pre-workout. And you're not getting the jitters. You're not running off to the toilet every five minutes and taking a runny dump. It is the real deal. We think you'll really love it. So we have a fantastic offer for you today. If you go to liquidiv.com and use promo code YNK at checkout, you're going to get 25% off your entire order. Can you believe that deal? Don't go running off to the stores. You need to be taking advantage of this, please. If you go to liquidiv.com, use promo code YNK at checkout, Get 25% off your entire order. Tell them Steve sent you. Because I, I just, it's super inspiring what you're doing. Thank and, you, man. Yeah, and how you're doing it really resonates with me all the way around. Yeah. You know, I think my NFL career really, it showed me the the pitfalls and the the dysfunction of corporate environments. You know, the inhumanity of it, the inhumaneness. Absolutely. Because you can get Thank into, you. you know, we're human beings, man. And you get into, like for me, football was family. Yep. These are my brothers. The coaches, for lack of a better term, my fucking father figures. Yeah. You know, I'm willing to do anything it takes, anything and everything to be out on the field, to produce, to it get a crazy it done. relationship, the player coach. Yeah, and then you're in the NFL, and all of a sudden it's like you got to, you know, my back is fucked up, and I'm start, my body's starting to fade on me, and I go from being the golden child to being exiled. And no, you know, nobody can really tell, Eb, we're going to go with the other guy today. How, what did that do to you emotionally? It crushed me. It was soul-crushing, dude. I was, it was my last year in Jacksonville. Um... The year before, I had this, I had back surgery. Came back, was fucking bawling out, had, having literally an all-pro year. Like, our O coordinator came up to me after one of these games. He's like, Eb, you're, you're fucking bawling, bro. Like, and they moved me to left guard. That was just a really good fit for me because I'm super violent anyway as a player. And um, our O coordinator's like, dude, you're, you're on track to be an all-pro this year. Crazy. I was like, fuck What yeah. year was this? This was 2011, 11 weeks after surgery. So probably like three weeks after he said that to me, we're in Pittsburgh playing the Steelers. I wake up in the hotel room. I can't get up because my back is seized up. I don't know what's wrong. I'm like, my fucking hip might be cracked. Maybe I went too hard coming out of uh, the back surgery and like it's just totally fatigued. But I can barely sit down to take a shit, like, in the, in the morning. I, I'm like, fuck it. Warrior mentality. I pop some Vicodin, take some Adderall, go down to the team meal. I'm, like, shuffling through, get on the bus, go to the go to Steeler, the Heinz Field. Immediately go into the training room to get start getting loosened up and worked on. Dude's, like, got the heating pack on my back. I'm like, dude, I don't know what's going on, but my back is super stiff. More pills. I go to get up off the table after the dude's been with the, um, like, the Theragun thing yep. for 20 minutes. I can barely get up off the table. 
I'm like, oh, fuck it. I'll be fine. Go to lie down in front of my locker to stretch more because I'm still fucked up. I look up and I see offensive coordinator, head coach, Jack Del Rio, O-line coach, looking down at me going, Ev, you going to be able to go today? And I'm like, yeah, and I couldn't get up. So they're like, all right, you're 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 going to sit down today, Eb. You need a break. You've been, you know, working really hard coming out of that surgery, so you need a break. So I'm like, okay. I go and get an MRI the next day on Monday when we get back to Jacksonville. Yeah. Looks fine. Nothing's really wrong. Um, go back into the facility. They're like, Eb, we're just going to give you a week off. Like, you need a week off just to rest. And I love Coach Jack, and um, he, he was like, you just need a rest, man. You, you came back really strong. You've been kicking ass. Maybe we overworked it. Like, mm-hmm. just take a break. So I take a week off, get another MRI the next week because something's just not right. They put me on, a like, a steroid pack for to, like, jumpstart the – my system get another mri still nothing's coming up it's weird i'm like dude i feel like something's wrong here that's how i feel right now currently yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. zero um, contact sports in me in the last decade that's how i feel but this day i'm walking into the facility and i just parked my car in the parking lot and i'm walking into the facility and um I seize up in the parking lot and brought to my knees. And one of my teammates has to, like, pick me up and help me walk into the training room. They're like, what is going on, dude? I'm like, bro, my legs are giving out on me. I don't know what's happening. Finally, it takes, like, another two MRIs to figure out that I have an infection in my disc from the back surgery. Well, it was really probably from after the back surgery. I have to go on eight weeks of intravenous antibiotics. During that time, I'm at home. They, they just keep me home. I have a nurse coming to my house every day to inject me with these, these fucking antibiotics. I'm watching the Today Show, and the season had really gone to shit. It's like Jags team sold, head coach fired. That's how I found out at home watching the Today Show. And uh, so... They bring in a new head coach. There's a new owner, Shad Khan. I work my ass off. I'm like, fuck it, man. Like, this is what I do. I'll be back. Mm -hmm. Work my ass off. Come back for that fourth year. Spring, I'm, like, getting my legs back under me. You know, my body was was fucked up. Yeah. You know? And, uh, but I'm, like, getting my legs back under me. I'm still, I'm starting at right tackle. Kind of, like, moving between right tackle and left guard. But something's not clicking with the head coach, this guy Mike Malarkey. He's just, he is his namesake. Um, <laughs> but he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, like, he would give me shit all the time. Like, I love to dip. And he'd be like, Eb, how's that dip? Like, trying to make me feel bad about dipping and shit. I had a, my coach at Duke was like that. Such a hard Such a hard And, Something's not clicking, but I work my ass off. I'm starting at left guard, first game of the season. We're playing the Vikings. Like, third play into the game, a dude gets thrown into my left ankle. I get a high left, a left, a low high ankle sprain. I'm done for the game. I miss two weeks. The team doctors are telling me this is a three week recovery. My agent. And I get a second opinion. That doctor says, this is like a six to eight week recovery and you're lucky you don't need surgery. But team docs are going, this is a two or three week recovery. Head coach is calling me, like trying to, they're, they're starting to think I'm like ducking out, like I'm fucking, one of my good friends was on the practice squad. They're like, are you not playing so that he can get a spot on the roster? I was like, what kind of sick fuck do you think I am? That's the donkey. Is that the donkey? That's that w- the fucking that fucker donkey. that wake you up in the morning? No, because I've been awake, but that's the fucking donkey, dude. Dude, that sounds that sound like someone was dying down there. 
Are they fucking? They might Are donkey be. fucking off in the donkey distance somewhere? Talk about ambiance. <laughs> um, so you're telling me that the dude, while you were hurt, he thought I was like pulling some mastermind scheme to get my buddy paid. I was like, what? Like, I don't even know what you're saying. What a weird. So anyway, I come back. I rush back. We're playing the Bengals. I'm telling them all week. I'm like, guys, I can't push off. To, I can't move to the right. They're like, it'll be fine. We'll tape it up. It'll be good. We'll give you your pills. It'll be fine. Pills are good. Pills are good. Pills are good. <laughs> I'm like, guys, like, I'm f I am can't fucking move. But they're like, it's fine. You're going to be fine. I'm like, okay, well, uh, yeah, I'll give it everything I got. I'm, I'm the fucking guy, you know? <laughs> so game comes. I'm playing Geno Atkins, who's an all-pro D tackle, and I get my ass kicked. I get benched <laughs> at halftime. There's a huge fight. We come into the locker room at halftime. There's like a huge fight going on, which I then later realized was my line coach and the head coach fighting. Not you. About me. And uh, my head coach, or my O-line coach comes in all just flustered. I'm good. And he's like, he's like, Eb, we're going to sit you down for the second half. We're going to let Brewster come in. I'm like, I'm like crushed. Because I'm already crushed because I've been getting my ass kicked. Yeah. And then the head coach comes in, Mike, and he's like, Eb, we need you to get healthy. I'm like, uh, all right, man. I've got tears coming down. Was, uh, never in my life, mm -hmm. you know. Spent my life as the team leader, the team captain. So I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm getting benched, but it's because I'm hurt. Right. After the game, in the press conference, Mike Malarkey goes, yeah, we'll see who our left guard starter is next week. I'm like, oh, okay, bitch. Yeah, he's just a douche. So that week, we're playing the Bears. I work my ass off, earn the left guard spot for the week, start that game, start the next game. And then after the, like, the following week, it's like week seven, I get, they basically tell me they're benching me. Mm -hmm. And I was just, like, heartbroken. Mm -hmm. I was crushed, you know? I was like, man, all this yeah. time. And nobody would really talk to me. They wouldn't, like, really acknowledge it. It's funny, man. I have a very similar experience. You know, and uh, it just fucked me up, dude. It really, f it, it crushed me. Mm. My confidence, who I was, it destroyed yeah. me. And, um, you know, it was really heartbreaking because I was like, this is my family. This is who I, yeah. these are the people I love. Like, I, I've worked my ass off to get back here. So, you know, man, that's... That has been like a lifetime out of football, like gaining myself back from that, you know, mm -hmm. because it was so jarring, it was so jarring. But, you know, man, it's like the most, one of the most brilliant lessons of my life, that whole thing, you know. Can relate more, yeah. Taught me about energy of people. Mm -hmm. Like people can say anything they want to your face, but their energy speaks volumes to you. Totally. You know, how they look at you. Yeah eye contact, their body position, how they Absolutely. carry themselves. Yeah. It's all signs. So, you know. When you uh when you came so when you you find yourself on the you have the realization you're just you're, you're just done playing. When did that happen? <sighs> that was really I mean after that year in Jacksonville, I was like I think I'm done. Yeah. I talked I talked to my wife, I talked to my dad, I talked to this guy Brad Meester, who's our starting center. I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think I can do this anymore, mm. you know. And um, everybody was super supportive, you know. But Brad was really like, hey, man, every year I think I'm done. But every year I just give it one more shot, one fucking day at a time. And, like, here I am, you mm. know. He's like, why don't you try out free agency? See if another team picks you up. Maybe fall in love with it again, dude. Yeah. You know? Or if you don't, you know. Yeah, I think you that's know? great advice. I was like, okay. So I had two workouts. I flew out to Seattle, worked out for the Seahawks. I was like, you know, not. I wasn't in, you know, I was really strong because I spent that whole off season just lifting my ass off. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't like. Yeah, it's different. I was stiff, you know. I was yeah. like, 
So they sent me, they were like, all right, man, we'll let you know. I appreciated it. I flew back to Jacksonville. The next day I flew to Chicago. Worked out for them immediately. They're like, Eb, we love you. We want to sign you here. You know, we think you'd be great. And I'm like crying talking to my agent because I don't know if I'm happy or sad about this opportunity. I'm like, here I am. I'm going to, I guess I'm going to give this one more shot because I fucking need the money. And I got, you know, a wife and daughter and like, I don't know what else to do. So I signed with the Bears, had a really magical year. Like we were like eight and eight. Crazy. Um, But I was, I earned the spot as like the sixth O lineman, but I got to play monster tight end. So I was playing like 20 to 30 snaps a game killing it like the chicago tribune wrote this whole article about me how when i came in the offense was 30 percent more productive on run wow. and pass plays so i like really it's I, crazy that happened after you felt like you were done yeah 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 it was what i needed you know yeah. to feel good about myself and make like, you feel like you were right the whole yeah i'm kind of like yeah fuck them um so after that year i had a really great year but came out of that like I think I could get a solid free agent deal now. But the reality is, you're, you know, you're a fifth-year veteran offensive lineman mm-hmm. who's had a bunch of injuries, mm-hmm. you know, and, like, teams don't want to spend money on that. Right. You know? Like, just my minimum is getting up towards a million dollars a year, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So I end up signing back with the Bears for one more year. All the same coaches Almost the whole, all the same team, vibe is totally different. Coaches are just like in their ego. We're not installing plays the same. I'm like, something's different here, man. Uh, we were just talking about that down there at lunch about the ecosystem. Yeah. And like, <clears throat> you know, why some, some quarterbacks, like, uh, you know, can have, you can have an amazing, you can have an amazing run with a team. Yeah. And then, you know, like a Carson Wentz or whatever, he actually had an injury, but you know, that that idea that like, it could be the same fucking players and people, same ingredients, but like if the, if the dynamics aren't right, yeah. the ecosystem is completely different. Yeah. It's insane. And we just, yeah. I think football is a great example of that because there's so many yeah. moving parts. It's such a, it's the ultimate team game. Yeah, it really know? is. Ultimate, even beyond the guys on the field. I know, you know? it really is, the strategists. Yeah. So I came back. That year really kind of was an, a shitty year. Team was terrible. Like we went from being a record-setting offense and like literally one game away from the playoffs to just like couldn't do anything. Right. Piss poor, mm. you know. Um, and I was cut after the last preseason game. Mm. I'd torn my fucking hamstring in half. Second day of pads and training body was camp. Just going. yeah my body was going so i worked my way back they actually signed first game of the year game one i'm watching it in my apartment in chicago and the stadium's like down the street three starting o linemen go down in the first quarter they're calling me in the second quarter the gm is on the phone Ed, are you in town we we need to sign you back I'm like, <laughs> we need you for the next, we need you for the next fucking third quarter, down, third and short. The next half. I'm like, uh, yeah, motherfucker, I'm here. <laughs> um, so I come back, but I was like, I was fucking over it, man. You yeah. know? And that year was really weird and fucked up. Like my appendix ruptured during the bye week. I got stuck in LA, had to have an emergency appendectomy. Body was scratching and clawing. Yeah, to get my out. universe, the universe was like, dude, yeah. it's time. Yeah. You're done, you know. Yeah. So it was a it was like towards the end of the year that year where I'm sitting in the film room and I'm going, what the fuck am I doing here? I don't know what I'm doing here anymore. <laughs> For real though. You know? Yeah. Like I'm I'm in so much pain and like this coach doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. I don't want I used to want to kill that D end that I'm going up against. Like I like that D end. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> You know, and I was like, that's it, man. <laughs> yeah. And that killer instinct was gone, you know, because yeah. forever it was like, I went out onto the field to fuck people up. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Athletes, when we talk, you, you talk about it a lot, just the, the transition into real life. I think a big part of it, why it's so hard on athletes specifically, is just like, 
you identify with that killer instinct so much. It's, yeah. it's kind of what, what makes you cool to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I have this, like, I'm a beast, you know? Like, yeah. I just get a win. I always get a win. I'm better than I, you know? And, like, that's what got you there. Yeah. So you're programmed to be like, yo, this is what makes me dope. Yeah. And then when you lose that, it's, like, unearthing, you know? And, uh -huh. and can be really rattling. I remember having those, just, like, I lost... It was a very, very com hyper competitive guy. Yeah. And as as a as I start to feel that fade, I felt like I was like turned into a big pussy. You know what I mean? Like totally. turn it. Oh, like you get old. Like I'm not playing sports, and you get older, and you're like. But like, once I was able to switch it and be like, Yo, this is actually how it's supposed to be. Like this is a blessing. I don't want to be like that. Then I started exponentially getting. Yo, know, the my. I'm competitive. I don't, I don't even, I wouldn't even classify myself as competitive. Really. I guess when we play beer pong, I want to win. Yeah, shit. of course. That's, that's, that's our fucking Super Bowl. Of course. <laughs> the Bolina Cup. But yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting as men, and especially as men, but also as like dominant men, alpha men, um, who go on to be, yeah. you know, immortalized by their peers and, you know, everyone admires that killer instinct they have and what makes them so great. But when you know you're losing it, it's hard for you to accept that and not like kind of dislike yourself. Yeah, you know, you it's a really interesting thing, man, because you know, once you get on the spiritual path, it becomes like you can't do things as a means anymore. Mm. Yeah. It's like that quote from Alan Watts you talk about. Yeah, you're you know? exactly right. Music and dance are the two art forms that exemplify the nature of life more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about like getting somewhere, you know? Like he says, if, if music was about getting to a destination the fastest, or, you know, getting somewhere, the orchestras that played the fastest would be considered the best, right. you know? Right. And so with sports, it's like, like Tom Brady, for instance. I don't, he has to just love doing it. Yeah, a million percent. It's not even about really winning. Yeah. It's just about loving the art form. Yeah. You know? It's totally. like you with music. Totally. You know? Or me, I kind of consider my life my art, you know? It's I think like, that's a great way of looking at it in general for anyone. Yeah, it's just like, man, I don't... And it's like... And it's that thing, you know? It's that inner compass of taking you where you're supposed to go. It's like if you're always just in the moment, enjoying the thing for what it is... That's what life is. Yeah, but dude, you were saying it earlier, like, you were blessed by the universe and, like, you know, that example of that guy coming up to you in your second year, mm -hmm. and coming in and, like, kind of showing you this other passion that was right there. Uh -huh. You know, like, I, I say this a lot and I really mean it. Like, it's that power of, no, power of now aspect where, like, yeah. if, you can, if you can be in a great vibe in the moment, you're freeing up space. Yeah there's less static in your frequency to then be open and willing and and receiving of you know life's what life's gonna throw at you next your path you know like if you're in a bad vibe because of something that happened in the past or something that's happening currently you're blocking yourself from actually getting to the right place and next. you're polarizing yourself to receive more of that shit, exactly you know you're not you're not going to receive it because you're your energy is just ass backwards. You know, when it's you're, really interesting yeah. to say that in that context of me meeting Dave. I mean, that's how I felt about my, when I really, really took inventory of my, my journey from into music, it was uh -huh. so random and crazy. It just <sighs> happened. But like, dude, I, if I was in a negative frequency, I was actually very, very sad mm -hmm. about it. Like I, all I was was a baseball player to me. Yeah, yeah. So I was very sad, but I like kind of, I think it was the competitor in me. I couldn't show my cards, and I, uh -huh. I kind of like tricked myself just to be happy and go easy going about it. Like my parents seemed more visually upset when we would talk about it because they knew this was my path. You know, like that was what we were banking on. But my point is, I don't even think I would have been in a creative vibe. Think about how what vibe you got to be on to go make a rap song in your room, put it out. You can't be like, yo, fuck, man, I'm. <laughs> Everyone's over at Georgia Tech playing, and I'm here in my room. <laughs> totally, you know I mean, dude. I was on a fucking vibe talking shit about how many girls I fucked last week. You know what I'm saying? And I made a song. Yeah. But my point is, my freak, my vibe, I was able to keep my vibe even when I was in the trenches, like, actually, uh -huh. you know? I was able to, and I credit that for 
I, this whole life that I didn't even know existed, I went on to live. Yeah. At that point, if you told me, oh, you're gonna be good, you're gonna be a musician, I'll do all this shit, I'd be like, what the fuck are you talking you're about? Like, what? Seriously, no, I had not. people call me and be like, what the fuck is this? Uh -huh. Like they had no idea I made music whatsoever, and then it was like kind of going viral. <clears throat> I had so many friends hitting me and just being like, "What is this shit?" It was there was no like background to me in music where like, "Oh, that could happen." Yeah, you know, if you knew me, you're just completely shocked by it. My point is, life threw me this crazy, crazy curveball circumstance. Uh -huh. But I, you could say I found my way there. But really, dude, if I was in a negative vibe and I sure. was kind of down the dumps about it, I would have never did that. For sure. This whole thing wouldn't have existed, you know? Yeah. Well, it's so multidimensional, man. Because it's your output. It's stuff beyond your even control, your conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, just like your cellular makeup. Absolutely. Generates a specific energy, mm -hmm. you know? Which kind of puts you on that specific, very specific track. And then you have to, uh, you have to, you know, use your willpower. You have to put it into action. Yeah. You know, you have to get into action to realize it. Yeah. You know, to actualize it. Right. But at the same time, you know, so then it's, a, and yes, I don't, you know, the universe brings you things, but you also have to be able to receive it. Yeah. You know, because you could have been like. Totally. Eh. No, I think, I, I, yeah, exactly. You know? That's kind of the point. Right, like, right. That's like what, if you could give advice to people I, that, because a lot of people, I'm sure you get the same thing, just given on how you speak in Hotbox and what you talk about. A lot of people hit me, and that's the biggest piece of advice I found myself repeating. It's just like, they had, something bad happened. And in their world, you know, it's it's like- The end of the world. The end of the world. Yeah. Where I'm just like, it's gonna be fine, yeah. man. Like, yeah. But my, my big, the well, biggest- Well, what piece is that of, thing? Because I feel like you've probably always had that. I've always had that. Like, no matter what comes, if I'm still breathing, I still got a shot. Yeah. You know? You know, I talk about this a lot, man. I, I, uh, I'm I pretty interested and on board with the ideology of, like, I'm not, I don't really take, I've gotten <sighs> to a point really, really recently where I don't take, like, ownership of a lot of the shit that's yeah. happened. Now, you could say, man, you got to have the willpower and you work your ass off. Yeah, and you yeah. But, dude. Why was I lucky enough to have a brain the way it is? I know. Why was I lucky to have parents that programmed me that I could do it? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. that's out of my control. Yeah. So, like, really, is it, yeah. is it me? And you when you really get down, you know, when you really start fucking meditating and you break through that veil, you're like, I'm not doing shit. Yeah, you, that's how I feel. Yeah. I, I, got, I got Don't I Try tattooed right here. Yeah. Because anytime don't I'm... Don't try, bro. Anytime I'm trying, it's, it's not natural, like... Yoda said it best, you know? There is no try, only do. Exactly. You know? Exactly. That's really Because when you're I had this realization once. Cuz that's kind of, that was a that was a part of my vernacular that I I worked on eradicating. Try saying I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. I'm trying, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm on trying, that way to try to eliminate it. And yeah. I was like, "No, dude, because trying is literally the active state of not doing." Mm. you're literally not doing the shit when you're trying to do it you know Facts. it's like fuck the trying you're either doing it or you're not doing it mm -hmm. that's the two places you can be in mm -hmm. you know and and when i realize that and i've taken that out of my vernacular it's literally you know it's just like what am i on today you know like you were saying i might grind my ass off for four straight days like when i was writing this book it just kind of came through me mm -hmm. the ebb and flow and it was like for three weeks, I literally, I wrote, you know, I just burned through writing 10 chapters, you know? And. That could literally take 10, that could take five years. For yeah, you, yeah. You know? But it did, it took me like four years for that to co coagulate. You to that. Yeah. You, you know? Live, yeah. And the whole time I'm living that, people, you know, my wife in particular, because she was really the, the one who said, like, Eb, you're done playing. You've got a stack of journals that you've been writing about your football career. It's time to write your book. Bless you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, yeah, I did want to be a writer a long time ago. That's cool. You know? You were doing it all along, kind of. So for four years, I was like, fuck, I'm writing this book, but I'm not writing anything. But then all of a sudden, you know, six months ago, it's like, 
oh, I know, I know what I'm writing. I know what to write. I know exactly how to write it, what to do, yeah. how it's going to be formatted. You know, and I'm sure, I mean, music is such a, I love music so much, dude. And I think that's so cool that Music is f- fucking saved my life, Because it's man. pure flow, you yeah. know? And especially what you do. Yeah. You know, and fucking, it's just like. I mean, the. It's the, amazing, dude. Thank you, man. I, I totally agree. The music. I uh, started to fall in love with music once I started to realize it wasn't a task. Mm. Mm-hmm. I was going to the studio like, oh, I'm writing a song today, man. I'm going to yeah. do this. Like, <laughs> yeah. Really, there was a lot of things that needed to happen. I needed to learn how to do it all myself, Yeah. which that, was, that sucked, but I did yeah. it. Yeah. And it actually didn't suck. It, I should retract that. It's just like it was the one time where I like, actually had to fucking work a little bit. Like every, The music shit just came to me. I didn't really work. This was like yeah. the element of me putting in the legwork. Like, yeah. Cause then it unlocked another level of creativity. Like this next music I have is like, is fly shit. Not to say the other shit was, isn't or wasn't or whatever, it was cool, you know? But like, I just know how I feel. Uh-huh. Like this, I've like finally made it a flow thing. And it's uh-huh. just like, I don't try at all. And it's yeah. just like what you said about like coagulating, like every, everything I do every day now, like I feel like I'm constantly <clears throat> working when I'm just living yeah. because I'm able to, and I feel really lucky to have a job where I can actually say that and mean that. Like I can go fuck off and have three nights where we go crazy and then have have a week of doing hikes and doing nothing. But all of that is gonna create yeah. when I make six songs yeah. in the next five days, like it's all going into that. Well, you did create this life for yourself too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um you know, we're definitely blessed, but you created this world for yourself. And something you said in there earlier, man, really is how I I live and really what I'm I'm it's my practice to settle into this mode. But like you said, like everything you do in your life, partying, hiking, writing, podcasting, meeting with people, business. It's all feeding the art. It is. You know. And that's such an important way to look at things, mm-hmm. you know, so that you're never, you never feel like, um, why the fuck am I here? I'm exactly. wasting my time. Exactly. You know? It's, it's, uh, when I had, when I said that Alan Watts quote that you just referenced, um, about dancing and, and how every, every note, every, every, every part of the, every second of the song needs to be savored and actually need to be, needs to be given attention to in order for you to really acquire what the song was really all about like you have to be in there and be with it yeah no i said and then after i was like so the days when you go on a hike with your boys you didn't even think about work those are important notes in the song you know what i mean and and i think for people who are a lot of people aren't really happy with where they are exactly in their lives i think that's a really good little nugget of information to take and be like all this shit is crafting me for who i'm supposed to be everything like the alchemist the book like yeah you have to you have to take percent. all these fucking steps. And, and once you start judging where you are in life and just accepting it for being part of the song, you can fucking really, like, it can really ground you in the now and you can make, actually make better decisions and have better experiences, you know, yeah. in the now. Yeah. I think it's really important, especially Definitely for young does. kids, you know, like people getting out of college, that transformation, like you keep referencing the athlete to like normal life, which is, an extreme version of it but there's so much of just oh, like oh yeah uh um i'm an adult now uh-huh what the fuck do i do you know what i mean like I, i'm not fucking off in the dorm and like you know what i'm saying like yeah i'm actually out here in the real world and i have an apartment i'm by myself you know like yeah. so there's a lot of i think it, it really becomes a mind game you have to like you have to see it through that lens it's so funny hearing you talk about that it's like Maybe we all just feel the same things. It just looks different, you know? Yeah. It's really, it's really what it is. You know, because it's like the Mike Tyson thing. It's like I resonate so much with Mike's story, but mine looks so much different. Mm. But it's like these things are common. It's, you know, it's like the mountain. You know, everybody's going to climb the mountain. Everybody's going to have a different experience of it, though. Mm-hmm. Or the other way around. Yeah. You know? Um, but yeah, man, that's our whole life, dude. Cause it's like you said earlier, the only constant in life is change. So you might as well just let go. Yeah, go with it. 
just go with the flow. Are you on the Tao wave, the Taoists? Um, I'm kind of always been Zen and Tao, yeah. 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 I mean, that the Taoists, I bring that up, is just because that the whole art of letting go is a huge. <clears throat> the art of letting go is like a huge. Uh, That's my life. Yeah. The art of letting it's go. It's a huge part of the Tao, th- and I, I, it captivated me. I was like, yeah. wow. Like, this- you see my, my posts are almost like fucking yeah. seven out of ten of my posts are about letting go. Because I'm always like that, man. I go for walks around my neighborhood. And I'll just breathe the whole time. No music, just out there walking. Mm -hmm. And every time I breathe, breathe in. (sighs) Breathe out. Just let go of all the stress, man. Let go of all the stress. Just let it all go. Are we going right into an ebb and flow right now? We can if you want. (laughs) So Um, for for everyone listening, (laughs) we we filmed it, so we could could cut in some... Yeah, yeah, but we 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 got the live and in person shirts off about thirty degrees out here, uh, breathing, um, stretching, a breathing stretching. What would you call it? Is that the ebb and flow? Yeah, yeah, that's the ebb and flow. Yeah, part of the that's one aspect of the ebb and flow right there. Yeah, how'd you feel after? Amazing. Really, you really Amazing. did, right? I really did. Physically, mentally. I mean, you know, I'm on this wave. Like, I, yeah, I, I know you are. But like that, I had never done, and I was like, Blue, Blue, how did you feel? Me and Blue said we gotta do it all the time. Perfect, dude. And it's really quick, man. It's awesome. You know? Yeah. I've taken like everything. The the most important thing of that is the breathing. Yeah. Because we don't realize breathing opens your body up like nothing else. Mm. Well, that's why yoga is so powerful because it really taps you into your breath. Like yogis do incredible shit. I know. I know. Like when you really learn about yogis in india the shit they can do i mean these motherfuckers are levitating yeah for freak, real freak you know? athletes too yeah. like they do really sh- running for like 24 hours straight it's all breath dude on the smallest scale i went to hot yoga i you yeah know, i've it's they, amazing my fan base is aware of my back issues <laughs> yeah yeah i love it <laughs> i've talked about it good man um, you're gonna help a lot of dudes yeah we're going on record where evan's gonna correct my, we had a little yoga after you showed me what you yeah, did because you obviously you had a very bit. extreme back injury yeah man um, but dude, I went to hot yoga in Scottsdale when mm-hmm. I was like, all right, fuck this shit. I gotta get my, I gotta start taking my back seriously. Or this is just going to be, yeah, you have to. Yeah. You're and, a big dude. You're an athlete. Yeah. Right? You're like, yeah. You have to. And I was like kind of hating myself for not, not, at, not being as proactive as I needed to be. I started going to hot yoga. That's the first thing I said to these guys. I was like, I've been humble. Uh-huh. Like I couldn't do half the shit they were doing in there. This fucking Hot old yoga guy. will literally end you. It ended me, and I was yeah. like, "Oh, I'm a piece. Like I'm nothing." <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I came out so humbled yeah. by it. Like There's this like old, old lady ladies. next to me crushing yeah. it. Yeah. Fucking crushing every pose. Yeah. I was oh like, "Man, God. it's a whole other world." Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad that worked because it's just you know I've taken it. I've learned a lot of. I've learned from some fucking world class strength coaches. And yeah yogis and fucking my mom is a yogi my dad is a lifetime athlete and i was really blessed to get this really deep knowledge of physiology Mm -hmm. and kinesiology like how the body works like my back was going out when i was like 10 my back would fucking go out wow and that experience where you can't hold yourself up and my mom just like knew these things like, she would be like, okay, get on the floor, do this, do this, do this. I'd get up five minutes later, I'd be better, hmm. you know, because it just, like, reset everything. Might need to dial your mom in for this, for my next Yeah, she's a master, back too, episode. bro. She's next level. <laughs> um, but, yeah, man, I'm glad, you know. I, I don't know, man. I just, my purpose here is just to make the world a better place and to help people, you know, yeah, to be a beacon you. of light. And that's, like, I don't know. I still have a lot of shit, you know, that I'm working through and shit that doesn't serve me anymore and Mm -hmm. (sighs) doubt, like I said, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's not always, you know, you work your ass off and it's not really coming to fruition as the way you thought it should be or not happening the way you think it should be because we're constantly doing that, you know, even when you meditate every day, you know, you can still get into a thing of like, you know, why isn't it this way? I've been doing it for so long. Right. And then I remind myself, Eb, you worked your ass off for 10 years on a straight line to the NFL, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. 
now you're figuring it out from scratch mm -hmm. it's gonna take some time yeah you know yeah but you're doing what you're doing what you know we talked about doing is what you're supposed to do in regards to even if if there isn't certainty your vibration like the what you're giving out and what you're putting out is all the positivity mm -hmm. you know that you're just gonna be like i said to you last night i think we said it in the last episode but i think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing it, it couldn't be like you're yourself so it's hard for you to even see but like just from guys who you know have just known you and watched you on hot boxing and then getting to hang out with you it couldn't be more <laughs> evident that you're right when where you're supposed to be doing in regards to like who you are genetically too like yeah. who your parents are like you yeah. couldn't be any more in the middle of that right and like you said you want to be a writer and you're writing a book and you're doing yeah you are a good storyteller like so i think all these i think you're right in flow what you're supposed to be doing i agree man i appreciate that appreciate it's that. been a fucking honor and a pleasure sir likewise man you're the man you're the man dude <laughs> we'll do it more i'm really glad you came out man me too well uh maybe get a hike We'll get a hike in, shoot some guns maybe yeah. at some point before yeah. we get out of here. Hell yeah, dude. All right, let's run it. I have to piss. Cheers. <laughs> That's how you end that one. I have to piss.